Hello. Before we begin, a quick note. The Boy to Sleep podcast relies on you and sponsors, which means you will hear a quick advertisement before the beginning of tonight's episode. While the podcast is free, you are welcome to subscribe for just $2.99 per month, which supports the creation of this podcast and gives you an ad-free listening experience. Simply click the link in the show notes from your podcast app. Rest easy. Hello. Welcome to the Bore You to Sleep podcast. The podcast that will hopefully help you get to sleep. I am going to read an open source book, one that is not particularly interesting, but one that is hopefully boring enough to get you to sleep. Tonight's reading comes from The Historian's History of the World in 25 Volumes. Volume 17, written by Henry Smith Williams and published in 1905. This story looks at Switzerland and surrounding countries during the 1700s. My name is Teddy, and I am to help people everywhere get a good night's rest. Sleep is so important, and my mission is to help you get the rest that you need. The podcast is designed to play in the background while you slowly fall asleep. For those of you who don't know, this podcast was originally created because I had my own issues with sleep. I wanted to bring another resource to people out there who may have had similar issues to my own. The podcast is self-made and self-produced, which is why you'll hear a quick ad at the beginning of each episode. With the help of subscribers and Patreon sponsors, I am able to keep delivering this podcast for free to those who need it. Thank you to everyone who shared their words of gratitude with me during the week, whether it be through the website or their podcast app. A massive thank you to the new subscribers via Spotify for Podcasters. And thank you also to all existing subscribers and Patreon sponsors. Thank you to all of the Spotify listeners who took the time to leave a response in the episode Q&A. Your responses in Spotify are very helpful, which is why I publish them right away to say thank you. If I ever miss thanking you on this podcast, please feel free to send me a message at boytosleep.com just to let me know. On recent episodes, I would like to say thank you to listeners Prav, Laurie Brown, Friend Lily, Third ID, Joe Woodhouse and Jones. Thank you each of you for your lovely responses. It really helps, and I'm glad to hear the podcast is helping you. If you find the podcast beneficial and would like to support the podcast, there are a few ways you can contribute. Be sure to follow the podcast in your podcast app. Of course, you're welcome to become a subscriber for $2.99 per month which will ensure that you remove any Spotify ads at the beginning of the episode. If that is not possible, then an easy way to support the podcast is by subscribing and leaving a review and rating in your podcast app. Even one sentence helps out. You can always say hello to me at boytosleep.com. In the meantime, lie back Relax and enjoy the readings. The Historian's History of the World in 25 Volumes Volume 17 Switzerland Continued Chapter 8 The 18th Century There is an evil worse than war, and that is the debasement of peoples. The wounds of war may be healed, 
but moral degradation leads nations to the tomb. During the peace that followed the Battle of Vilmergen, up to the time of the French Revolution, Switzerland suffered more calamities than in all wars against Burgundy and Austria. For during the eighty years of repose, during which the swords of Wickelands, the Fontanas, and the Halwals, and the Erlachs were tarnishing, the rust of egoism and of pride succeeded in eating away, the tablets on which was engraven the loyal union of the ancient Swiss. And like a corpse, the old confederation was rotting away. The outward peace enjoyed by the confederacy during the 18th century was contrasted by incessant inward disturbances. The first of these which claims our attention is the conspiracy of Hensi at Bern. Here, as in most towns of the Confederacy, a more and more formal and regular aristocracy had grown up by degrees in the course of centuries. From time immemorial, the powers of government had been held by the Avoya and Council. For the protection of the burghers against the encroachments of the council, and of that body against the influence of the multitude, an assembly of two hundred of the most respectable burghers was formed, the members of which were annually elected. The most important acts which imposed duties on every burgher, not only for himself but for his posterity, were often brought before the whole body of citizens, and even country people, the more so as at the time a few villages constituted the whole domain of Bern. The continual aggrandizement of the state rendered obsolete the fundamental laws of its constitution, which became imperceptibly modified in proportion as political emergencies appeared to require alterations. When the power of Bern was doubled by the conquest of the Vaud, the assembly of the burghers ceased to be thought of. The dignities of the state became hereditary in those families which had once obtained a seat in the great council. It is true that the other burghers remained eligible to public functions, but it was rarely indeed and generally by means of intermarriages, that a new family raised itself to the rank of the rulers de facto. The admiration of these ruling families was, in general, not devoid of wisdom and equity, and in fact the principal subject of complaint was that participation in state affairs had ceased to be open to all. It was, however, Precisely this system of aristocratic exclusion, which was felt so insupportably by many of those who were subjected to it, that so early as seventeen attempts were made to break it up. These were renewed with increased vigour in 1743, by six and twenty burghers who combined to petition the council for the revival of of a greater equality of rights in favour of the general body of citizens. These adventurous men incurred the censure of the authorities and were placed under arrest in their houses or banished. Among the exiles was Samuel Hensey, a man of no ordinary talent and spirit. He had fixed on Nucatel as the place of his banishment, the term of which was shortened by the favour of the authorities. On his return, the embarrassed state in which he found his domestic currency, and the ill success of his efforts to obtain a lucrative office, may have mingled with other motives in inducing him to take the lead in a desperate undertaking 
of a little band of malcontents who, without money, arms, or even unity of purpose, dreamed of overturning a government strong in its own resources and sure of support from the whole Helvetic body. Yet with all their root and branch work, the conspirators had no idea of remedying the real defects of the state, of satisfying the prevalent and increasing discontents of the void, or of procuring an extension of political rights to the whole people. For, in the plan of a constitution annexed to their mediated manifesto, exclusive regard was paid to the burghers at Bern, and the rest of the people would hardly have been bettered by their accession to the dignities which had hitherto been engrossed by the ruling families. The 13th of July, 1749, was fixed for the execution of the plans of the conspirators, but many of their own number had opened their eyes by this time to the utter impossibility of success produced by the disunion and imprudence of their colleagues, to the passion and cupidity of some, and the atrocious hopes of murder and plunder entertained by others. No man felt more sensibly the criminal views of his party than the only man of ability and public spirit among them, Hensey. He would not betray those with whom he had long pursued the same object, but he had made an attempt to save himself by flight from further participation in their plans and foreseen destiny. It was too late. A betrayer had already done his work. Hence he and other leaders of the party were taken and beheaded during the first exasperation of the government. Sentence of death was also pronounced upon some who had made their escape. Others were imprisoned or banished, but soon afterwards pardoned. On embarking with her two sons to quit the Helvetic territory, the wife of Hensey exclaimed, I would rather see these children sink in the Rhine stream than they should not one day learn to avenge the mother of their father. However, when the sons came to manhood, they displayed more magnanimity than their mother, and one of them who rose to distinction in the service of the Netherlands, requited with good offices to the burghers of his native town the unmerited misfortunes which they had brought upon his family. In Freiburg, where in olden times, equality of rights for all burghers had been settled as a principle, a no less choice aristocracy had formed itself than in Bern. Since the middle of the 17th century, a few houses under the denomination of sacred families, had contrived to exclude not only the country people, but a large proportion likewise of the town burghers from all participation in public affairs. And in 1684, admission into the number of these sacred families was rendered wholly impossible. From thence forwards, Constantly increasing discontent displayed itself both in town and country. Several very moderate proposals for alleviating the pressure of his oligarchy was rejected, with such haughtiness by the government, that disaffection swelled into revolt. In 1781, Peter Nicolas Chenot of La Tour de Treme, John Peter Accord and an advocate of Gruyere of the name of Castellas formed a league for the achievement of a higher degree of freedom. First, they endeavoured to work upon the people by fair promises. Then Cheneau, 
at the head of a select band of fifty or sixty, undertook to terrify the government into a compromise. But the gates being closed on the party, and the walls manned with armed burghers, this undertaking ended in open revolt. The toll of alarm bells summoned up the country people from every hill and valley in the canton, to assist in the coercion of the domineering capital. A body of nearly 3,000 men encamped before the walls of Freiburg, and further aid was hourly expected. The terrified burghers instantly called for the armed intervention of Bern, and the latter town detached a part of its guard without delay. 300 dragoons marched upon Freiburg and were to be followed by 1,400 foot. The burghers of Freiburg now thought themselves strong enough to meet force with force. The garrison made a sally from the town and the first sight of the Bernese flag, not to mention the heavy artillery. The malcontents solicited an armistice. The surrender of their arms and of the ringleaders was demanded as preliminary to all negotiation. The people refused the latter of these conditions, but fled panic-struck on the first attack, without making any resistance. The whole affair would have ended without bloodshed, had not the leader Cheneau been murdered in his flight by Henry Rosier himself one of the popular party. The two remaining heads of the insurgents got clear off. Cheneau's corpse was delivered to the public executioner, and his head fixed on a spear above the Romont gate. Sentence of death was passed on by Castellers and Record, the two fugitives. Several others were visited with less degrees of punishment, New reinforcements from Bern, Sullivan, and Lucerne secured the town from any recurrence of tumult, and their ambassadors strove to promote the restoration of tranquility. It was ordered to be proclaimed from all its pulpits that the council was well disposed to protect the old and well-attested rights of its loving subjects as well as to hear with its never-failing graciousness every suitable and respectful representation. Three days were allotted to each commune to lay their complaints and wishes before the government through delegates. But when months elapsed without the popular grievances having obtained a hearing, the loss of Cheneau began to be appreciated. Multitudes assembled round his tomb weeping and praying, pilgrimages, as if to the tomb of a saint, were made thither with banners and with crucifixes. Vainly were these demonstrations of feeling stigmatised by the government as crime against the state. By the vicious as impious profanations, they were neither to be checked by posting sentinels, nor fulminating excommunications. They were the last sad consolation of the people, the last substitute for hopes that they were already given up. Shortly after the establishment of Genevan independence, it had been decreed by the General Assembly for the better suppression of hostile attempts against their hard-won freedom, that whoever should propose a change in the government of Geneva should be considered to deserve capital punishment. This did not, however, hinder alterations being made at different times in various parts of the constitution. So early as the middle of the 16th century, the laws were revised and improved. The advantageous situation of the town and the long duration of peace promoted the increase of wealth in Geneva, 
and the rise of many families to opulence. These families aimed at separating themselves from their fellow citizens, even in their places of habitation by settling in the upper part of the town, near the council house, while the other burghers inhabited the lower town. The principal families already regarded themselves as a standing patriciate, and even the name of patrician came into the use in the Acts of Council. The year 1707 witnessed an effort of the inferior burghers to wrest from the principal families a part of their usurped power and to introduce amendments in this constitution. In the emergency, the council invoked the mediation of Byrne and Zurich, received a confederate garrison, and maintained itself by force of arms and by execution of its principal antagonists. A renewal of the disturbances, which had been quelled by such violent measures, was produced in 1704, by the imposition of an arbitrary tax by the council for the enlargement and completion of the fortifications of the town. This stretch of power occasioned great discontent among the burghers. Bitter attacks and censures on the government appeared in print, and the more strictly these were prohibited they obtained the more eager perusal and credence. One of the arch-promoters of the rising storm was Michael Ducrest, a Genevan burgher and noble, an officer in the army and a member of the Great Council. This man opposed himself with extraordinary vehemence to the building of the new fortifications and heaped offensive charges on the partisans of the measure. The government condemned him to recant, and on his evading compliance by flight, a penal sentence was pronounced against him. New attempts which he made to excite disturbance were followed by a sentence of perpetual imprisonment. This sentence could not be put in execution, as Ducrest had taken refuge under a foreign jurisdiction, where he set at defiance the Council of Geneva, and provoked that body to such a degree by his writings and intrigues against them, that sentences more and more severe were headed upon his head, until at length the most offensive of his writings was torn by the hangman, and his effigy was suspended from the gallows. His person, however, enjoyed impunity till 1744, when he was taken into custody in the territory of Bern. The government of Geneva did not thirst for his blood, and was content with his perpetual imprisonment. Even this situation he contrived to mix in Hensey's conspiracy, was confined in the castle of Arburg and closed in extreme old age as a state prisoner, a life which he had spent in incessant labours in the cause of democracy. Meanwhile, Geneva continued to be agitated by party manoeuvres and popular discontents. In the year 1734, a body of 800 burghers addressed themselves to the heads of government desiring the curtailment of the projected fortifications and the repeal of the land tax levied for the object. The council only replied by preparations for defence. Firearms were transported to the council hall, barricades erected in the approaches thither as well as those to the upper town, where the principal class of burghers lived and the garrison kept in readiness to act on the first signal. All this apparatus was regarded with mistrust by the burghers, who were still farther provoked by reports of the approach of Bernese troops, 
and by the removal of a part of the town artillery to the upper regions, while two and twenty other pieces were spiked. The multitude made themselves masters of the city guard, pointed field pieces on the road by which the troops from Bern were expected, and tumultuously demanded the convocation of the Burger Assembly, the sovereign authority of Geneva. The council contrived to win over the members of this body so far that they voted unanimously the completion of the fortifications and the continuance of the tax for ten years, the declaration of an amnesty and improvement of the criminal and judicial administration formed the rest of their business. The burghers laid down their arms and returned to their ordinary vocations, so that an embassy which arrived from Zurich and Bern found Geneva in a state of apparent tranquillity. Permanent ill will was fostered only against the syndic Trembley, a commander of the garrison and conductor of the defensive preparations of the council. Whatever this person had done by the instructions of the council was laid to his individual account and added to the mass of dark imputations which were heaped on him, as the head of an already obnoxious family. He plumed himself on the favour of the confederate ambassadors, and forfeited thus the last chance of retrieving himself in the public opinion. The remembrance of the armed intervention of Zurich and Bern in 1707 was too recent to admit of their ambassadors doing any good to Trembley's cause throughout the medium of Pacific intercession. The departure of these embassies removed the only screen of the syndic. He demanded his dismission, which was refused him. In order to deprive him of his functions more ignominiously, no resistance or artifice of a powerful connection could save him. The tumults were renewed with increased fury, and the question soon ceased to regard the person of party of Trembley, and became that of the triumph of the aristocratic or democratic principle at Geneva. In 1737, the council ventured several arrests, and the consequence was that the whole body of burghers rushed to arms, and the council was defeated, not without bloodshed. A garrison from Bern and Zurich was thrown into the town. The ambassadors of these cantons, in concert with the French ambassadors, undertook the office of mediators, and in 1738 framed a constitution which set limits to the assumptions of the council and the principal families, and was gratefully and all but unanimously accepted as a fundamental law by the burghers. After four and twenty years of repose and prosperity, occasion was given to the new political movements at Geneva by a subject of a nature purely speculative. It pleased more than one government about this time to apply the doom of fire, which had been visited by inquisitors on the ill-fated victims of their zealotry, to certain of the more remarkable works of the human intellect. A proceeding highly calculated to draw the eyes of the reading public on productions which seemed worthy of such signal condemnation. On the first appearance of that work of Rousseau, which opened views so novel and so striking on the moral and still more on the physical education of man, the Parliament of Paris had the work burned by the hangman and sentenced Rousseau to imprisonment, which he only escaped by flight. Both of these decisions were immediately repeated by the Council of Geneva in 1762, which improved on them by launching a like condemnatory sentence against the contrat social of the same author. 
It was in vain that Rousseau's connections demanded a copy of the sentence against him. Their reiterated demands, though supported by a large body of burghers, were rejected by the council. The popular party which vindicated the right of the burgher assembly to bring up representations or remonstrances against the council on any subject under discussion distinguished themselves by the name of representatives. Their claims were met by asserting a joint negative or right of injection on the strength of which the council pretended that nothing that should not have been previously consented to by themselves could come before the General Assembly. The partisans of the council were called negatives. The tranquillity of Geneva was once more disturbed to such a degree by passionate discourses, party writings and manoeuvres that the ambassadors of Zurich, Bern and France again interfered, and pronounced themselves in favour of the council. The representatives rejected their decision. The ambassadors left Geneva, French troops advanced on the town, and all trade and intercourse were suspended. But the French ministry speedily became lukewarm in the cause of the negatives. The latter, when they found themselves abandoned by all foreign aid, apprehending what might ensue, patched up a peace with the representatives. By a compact closed in March 1768, The burghers acquired valuable rights and even a third party, that of the so-called natifs or Herbetians, old inhabitants excluded by birth from taking part in public affairs, obtained extended franchises and was flooded with a prospect of participation in all the rights of citizenship. But on recovery from the first panic, reciprocal hatred soon revived. The negatives were vexed at having such important sacrifices and aimed at resuming all the former ascendancy. Moreover, they found a favourable hearing in the French court, which had long viewed with an evil eye the trade of wealth of Geneva. French emissaries therefore aided the negatives in spiriting the natifs up against the representatives by promising to confer on them the franchises withheld by the latter. But the representatives flew to arms, took possession of the gates and speedily succeeded in disarming the unpractised and undisciplined mob of natifs. Well aware by what manoeuvres the natifs had been led to revolt, they prudently abstained from taking any vindictive measures against them, but on the contrary imparted to them, in 1781, that equality of rights which had been compromised by the negatives, and endeavoured thus to win them over permanently to the common cause. The council, on the other hand, impelled by the French influence, declared the newly conferred rights illegally extorted and invoked the mediation of Bern and Zurich, but betwixt representative stubbornness and negative assumption. The ambassadors of these towns could exert but limited influence. They essayed to put an end to disputes by amicable arrangements but were baffled by the intrigues of the French court, which was resolved to recognise no democratical system, and as soon as proceeded to open force in support of its secret policy. The first act of aggression was to garrison Versoix, a measure which gave just offence to Zurich and Bern who thereupon renounced all adhesion to the mediation of 1738 and left the Genevans to their own discretion. France also declared she would mix no more in the affairs of Geneva. The government was overthrown and a new constitution established. 
Zurich and Bern now declared formally and coldly that they could not acknowledge a government erected by revolt. Still more indignation was exhibited by France and Savoy, who entered into a league for the coercion of the town. Bern too joined this league in 1782, that the destiny of Geneva, that point to a power of her own dominion, might not be trusted altogether to the caprices of foreign powers. On the appearance of the Allied troops before the gates of Geneva, the burghers, unaware of the bad state of their defences, swore to bury themselves in the ruins of their native town rather than yield. But when the cannon of the besiegers was advanced up to their walls, and the alternative of desperate resistance or surrender was offered, the disunited city opened her gates without stroke of sword. After the principal heads of the representative party had taken to flight, and that concludes tonight's reading. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this story. And if you're not quite tired yet, please feel free to listen to another episode. Until next time, good night.